Are you or someone you know preparing for a standardized test? You know, the ones with the acronyms ACT, SAT, GRE, GMAT, LSAT, MCAT. Magoosh Online Test Prep provides everything you need to get a great score with plans starting at just $79. Get study schedules, practice questions, video lessons, and support from expert tutors. Just visit magoosh.com and enter the promo code GRAMMAR for a 20% discount. That's magoosh.com and the promo code GRAMMAR. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a tidbit about the phrase pipe dream and a meaty middle about when you use a comma to introduce a quotation. It might be more complicated than you think. But first, two weeks ago, I proposed grammarista as something language enthusiasts could call themselves instead of grammar Nazi. But you, my dear listeners, outdid me many times over. I loved all your other suggestions. Katie, who goes by I Hate Toast, has a friend who uses Grambo, like Rambo. Kim on Facebook calls herself the Empress of Editing, and another Kim likes Grammar Smith, which I like too because it evokes the idea of a blacksmith, and my Twitter list of writers is already labeled wordsmiths. But my very favorite suggestion came from Lydia on Facebook, who recommended Guardians of Grammar, which in my mind immediately became Guardians of the Grammary because I loved the movie Guardians of the Galaxy. The ery suffix is used a few different ways. For example, it can indicate that you're talking about a place, such as a nunnery, a bakery, and a brewery. Where nuns live, or where people bake and brew. And it can also be used to describe an art or practice, such as trickery. My best find as I was researching the ery suffix, though, was in the Oxford English Dictionary, which notes that the ery suffix is often used to, quote, denote the place where certain animals are kept, unquote, such as a piggery and a swannery. Long-time listeners will remember how delighted I was when I discovered that there was once a royal position known as the Keeper of the Swans, and now I'm delighted again to learn that part of his job was probably managing the swannery. So I think if we can have distilleries and booteries and eateries and swanneries, we can certainly have an imaginary grammary, and we can all be its guardians. And I imagine we will have our own fabulous soundtrack like the movie. You are my guardians of the grammary. Thanks for all your great suggestions. And now, let's talk about pipe dreams. When a hospital worker in Massachusetts chose the lucky ticket in the Powerball jackpot last week, she won more than $750 million, the biggest jackpot in U.S. history. And she said, my pipe dream came true. After reading her statement, Robert Mittendorf on Twitter encouraged me to write about the term pipe dream because it has an interesting origin. Thanks, Robert. It seems that pipe dream was first used in the late 1800s to imply that something was like the hallucinatory dreams that people had when they smoked opium, which was usually done with a pipe. Back then, opium was mostly considered a useful medicine, and it didn't have the negative connotations and restrictions that it has today. There were even opium products such as syrup of poppies, which were given to children, even though many babies died when they were given too much. Yikes. Opium pipes had especially long stems and were sometimes called saxophones, gongs, and relevant to our topic today, dream sticks. Many of the poets of the Romantic era in Britain, such as Percy Shelley, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Lord Byron, John Keats, and Thomas de Quincey, took opium and believed the dreams and altered mental states affected their work. But it was in America that the term pipe dream was eventually coined. The earliest example of the phrase appearing in print, listed in the Oxford English Dictionary, is from the Chicago Tribune in 1890, and reads, Aerial navigation has been regarded as a pipe dream for a good many years. 
I like the second example better, though, because it sounds more dreamlike. It comes from the novel Pam, written by Bettina Riddle von Hutten in 1904. Just look at the sea and tell me if, in your wildest pipe dreams, you ever saw anything lovelier. Today, a pipe dream is usually something that's a fanciful idea or a plan that's unlikely to actually happen, like buying the winning ticket in a $750 million lottery. Before we get to the meaty middle about commas, I bet you've always wanted to learn another language. Maybe you want to visit exotic lands and actually be able to talk to the people who live there. Or maybe you have a more practical reason, like wanting to be bilingual so you can get a better job. Well, no matter why you want to learn another language, you want to try the app from our sponsor, Babbel, because it's the number one language learning app in the world. I always make the practical choice, so I picked Spanish. But Babbel has 14 languages you can choose from, so you could learn Indonesian, Turkish, Polish, Danish, and more. If you sign up for three months, you get three more months free, but you have to use my URL and code. Visit babbel.com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar. You can take the lessons on your desktop, smartphone, or tablet. With the short 10 to 15 minute lessons, you can go at your own pace and you get badges and encouragement to keep going. By immersing you in dialogues based on your native language and personal interests, Babbel is your shortest path to real-life conversations. Remember to sign up at B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar to get three extra months of lessons. Now, let's talk about commas. We recently got a question about commas from one of our listeners, Benjamin Wolfe. Benjamin asked this, Have you done a post on when to include a comma before a quotation? The rules seem dicey. Benjamin, we agree. This is one of those questions that doesn't have a single answer. In fact, there are four, count them, four different ways you can introduce a quotation. Each has its own punctuation rule. Let's take a look. As a general rule, you should use a comma to introduce quoted material or dialogue. That's because in most types of dialogue, the quoted material stands apart from the surrounding text. In grammatical terms, it's syntactically independent. Here are two examples from the first book in the Game of Thrones series. Maester Lewin said, comma, quote, Bran, the children of the forest have been gone for thousands of years, unquote. Tyrion Lannister undid his scarf, mopped at his brow, and said in a flat voice, comma, quote, how interesting, unquote. You can also use commas when a quotation is interrupted by a phrase, like he said or she said. In fact, you use two commas. For example, quote, what the king dreams, comma, unquote. Ned said, comma, quote, the hand builds, unquote. Quote, Bran, comma, unquote. John said, comma, quote, I'm sorry I didn't come before, unquote. In certain cases, you can skip the comma when introducing a quotation. First, skip the comma if the quotation is introduced by a conjunction like that, whether, or if. Following that guidance, I might write sentences like this. Eddard Stark is constantly reminding people that, quote, winter is coming, unquote. No comma. Lord Varys wonders whether, quote, we've grown so used to horror we assume there's no other way, unquote. Again, no comma. Tyrion Lannister said that, quote, a mind needs books like a sword needs a whetstone, unquote. Again, no comma before that quotation. Second, ask yourself whether the quotation blends into the rest of the sentence, or, speaking grammatically, if it's a syntactical part of the surrounding sentence. If the quotation blends in, the comma comes out. Here are two examples. It was the third time he had called her, quote, boy, unquote. I'm a girl, Arya objected. Fat Tom used to call her, quote, Arya Underfoot, unquote, because he said that was where she always was. 
And that's all we have to say about commas. But you can also use a colon to introduce a quotation. You do that when the quotation is being introduced by a grammatically complete sentence, also known as an independent clause. Here are a couple of examples. Daenerys often speaks one frightening word, colon, quote, Dracarys, unquote. Tyrion had sage advice for the singer, colon, quote, close your eyes and pretend you're dead, unquote. Finally, you can use a period to introduce a quotation. You do this when introducing a block quotation. That is a long quotation that's indented from the rest of the text. Here's an example. Sandor Clegane chastised Sansa thusly, period. And then we have a new indented paragraph. Some septa trained you well. You're like one of those birds from the Summer Isles, aren't you? A pretty little talking bird, repeating all the pretty little words they taught you to recite. One thing to note is that a block quotation, unlike a regular quotation, is not surrounded by quotation marks. The text being indented already marks it as a direct quotation. And just to confirm Benjamin's feelings that these rules are a bit dicey, let's mention that sometimes they can overlap and overrule one another. For example, a block quote might blend in to its introduction. In that case, the introduction wouldn't need a colon. Rather, it would take no punctuation. For example, Brand's old nan described the White Walkers as, and at this point, without any punctuation, we start a new indented paragraph, cold things, dead things that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun, and every creature with hot blood in its veins. They swept over holdfasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score, riding their pale, dead horses and leading hosts of the slain. All the swords of men could not stay their advance, and even maidens and suckling babies found no pity in them. In short, when deciding what punctuation to use when introducing a quotation, follow the rules we just described, and then use your best judgment. So that's your tip for today. Quotations are usually introduced with a comma, but in some cases they may be introduced by a colon, a period, or nothing at all. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Thanks this week to listeners who told me about their adventures. Tony listened on his way to Mount Rushmore, which sounds like a great end-of-summer vacation. Mariel on Instagram says she eagerly awaits each episode from Laos— I think you're the first listener I've ever heard from from Laos, Marielle, so thank you for checking in. That's especially neat. And Anna teaches English in a language academy in a small coastal town in the south of Spain, and she listens every week when she goes for a walk with her brother, Diego. Hi, Anna and Diego. I'm Mignon Fogarty. Grammar Girl is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips Network. You can find all my old articles and podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com, And if you're looking for another great podcast to listen to and you're stressed out, try the latest show from The Savvy Psychologist, What is Mindfulness and Should You Try It? That's all. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 